Hi everyone, my name is Liron Cohen, and today I will talk about some of the different solutions for achieving highly available long-term scalable Prometheus. A little bit about myself before we start. I have been a DevOps and Site Reliability Engineer for the past seven years. Before my current job as an SRE at Riskified, I was a DevOps consultant in multiple companies. And when I'm not working or studying, I enjoy traveling, diving, and basically anything water-related, as you can probably tell by my happy face in this photo. So before we will dive into the different solutions we decided to check, let's briefly talk about the issues we had. So what we started with was an architecture used by a lot of people and companies two Prometheus servers that scrapes metrics from the same targets, both monitor the same sets of jobs for high availability, where each Prometheus has its own local disk for durability. We're running on AWS, so in our case, it's EBS. What are the issues with this architecture? Well, it's not scalable. It's not really highly available. If one Prometheus is going down or in the process of a rolling update, there will be gaps in the data we will see, for example, in Grafana. So we can't really load balance between the different instances. There is no centralization, no global view of data. If, for example, we want to query multiple clusters, we can't. And there is no long-term storage of data. We can configure a retention of multiple years, as an example, this way. So we knew we needed a solution for all of these issues. And we knew that there are some tools that can help us. Eventually, we were left with three potential tools we decided we wanted to choose from. M3, Cortex, and Thanos. It's important to note that I'm not representing any of these projects. I'm not part of the maintainers of none of them. We simply wanted to examine their different architectures to understand what each tool can offer, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each tool, and how they differ from each other. Why did we want to know this? All of these projects have some similarities. They are all written in Go, open source projects, that are compatible with Prometheus. And they all offer us a solution that can suit to the issues we just talked about. All these projects offers a long-term storage for our metrics, a global view of data, they are horizontally scalable, and making sure our metrics are highly available and durable. All these solutions provide replication of time series data across regions and or availability zones. So it sounds like all of these tools are doing pretty much the same things. How can we compare them? Well, we decided to focus on different aspects that can be categorized according to four general categories, performance, high availability, cost, and operational complexity. I will start by reviewing each one of the architectures so we can understand what are the pros and cons of each and be able to compare all of them by the end. Eventually, I will tell you what we chose to use, but please remember that our choice was made before some new features were added to these projects. One last note, I will focus only on the write path and the read or query path of the architectures and will not show all of the components, such as the components that help us run rules over samples and integrate with the alert manager. This is to help us main focus on the main differences between these projects. So let's start by talking about M3. So M3 was originally developed by the observability team at Uber with the goal of providing teams with a highly available and centralized metrics platform. It's an open source project under the Apache tool license. The foundation of the platform is AM3DB, a distributed time series database, or TSDB, that has a built-in replication of time series data points across nodes on different availability zones and or regions. M3 is based on a push-based model, meaning the Prometheus servers use remote write API to push data to M3. So let's start by understanding how the write path works. First of all, Prometheus scrapes metrics as we know. Then the M3 coordinator, which can be deployed as a sidecar alongside Prometheus, 
gets Prometheus remote write request. It can also get Prometheus remote read request, as we will see in a moment. As its name implies, it's responsible for coordinating writes and reads in AMP3DB. Once metrics gets to AMP3DB, writes are compressed in memory and eventually flushed to the disk. The duration the data will remain in memory depends on the configured block size, which is the duration of time dictating how long new writes will be compressed in memory before being flushed to the disk. For example, block size can be set to two hours. There is also at CD, which stores the metadata used by each of the components. It means that the M3 coordinator and M3DB relies on at CD as a source of truth for clustering management. Basically, we can start by running only the M3 coordinator and M3DB with ATCD. You can also add another component, the M3 aggregator, that runs as a dedicated metrics aggregator and provides stream-based downsampling before metrics are stored in M3DB based on dynamic rules stored in ATCD. So this is the write path. What about the read path? Well, on the read path, Grafana or other API client sends its query to AMP3 query. This component is responsible for exposing the metrics and metadata of the time series stored in AMP3DB. So for writes to AMP3DB, we use a dedicated deployment of AMP3 coordinator instances. And then for queries, we can use a dedicated deployment of AMP3 query instances. Know that it's also possible to use just the M3 coordinator, if we don't mind that the read path and the write path won't be isolated. In order to support efficient reads, M3DB implements various caching policies that determine which flashed blocks are kept in memory and which are not. So that's another thing that improves performance. And as we saw previously, at CD stores the metadata used by each of the components. So what are the advantages of M3? First of all, data resides within the cluster, on disk, and replicated between availability zones and all regions. There is no use of cloud storage service such as S3 or Google Cloud Storage, which means that A, bandwidth costs are relatively low. So if you're running things both on-prem and on cloud, it might be a good idea for you to use M3. Since cloud bandwidth cost might be high when moving data between the cloud and on-prem data centers. And B, it means lower latency, which of course means a better performance. Fetching data from an object store like Amazon S3 might be slower than using local disk. It's also a push-based model system. Prometheus uses remote write API to send data to M3, which also have some advantages, in particular in use cases where you have ephemeral cluster or in terms of availability, if the Prometheus server becomes unavailable, all data up to that point is still available for queries. There are a few components, as you saw, which might make it easier to deploy. So and in terms of caching queries, there are various caching policies you can implement in order to support efficient reads. So we can see how the M3 solution is really focused on being a system that can manage huge amounts of data, even petabytes of metrics, with the primary concern to scale monitoring horizontally in a cost-effective nature. But the M3 solution also has some cons. M3DB might be complex to operate. After all, it's another database in your infrastructure that you need to take care of and learn how to bootstrap and recover. I will mention that there is an M3DB operator that aims to automate everyday tasks around managing M3DB, but it doesn't automate every single edge case. I will also mention that I found the M3 official documentation lacking, and it might be harder to understand, deploy, and debug it as a result. Second thing to consider is that M3 requires external dependency, at CD. So it's eventually one more cluster you need to take care of. And lastly, the push-based model also has some disadvantages. It might be more complex than a pool-based system like Thanos. We will discuss about it later on. And shipping samples from Prometheus over the network immediately as they are scraped is not very efficient. 
So after understanding some of the advantages and disadvantages of M3, let's talk about other solution to our issues. Cortex. Cortex is a CNCF incubating project and another solution for horizontally scalable, highly available long-term Prometheus. Its initial focus was mainly on scalability and high performance. And later on, in collaboration with Thanos team, the Cortex team also added other focuses to the Cortex architecture. When talking about Cortex, we can separate our discussion into two. Chunk storage, the storage that Cortex started with, and block storage the support for which was added recently with the help of the Thanos project during their collaboration. Most of the Cortex architecture is quite the same on these two use cases, but there are differences regarding the pros and cons and what we can get. Let's start by talking, by taking a look at the Cortex architecture in case chunk storage is in use. Cortex, like M3, also uses a push-based model, which means that the Prometheus server uses remote write API to push data to Cortex. So when talking about the write path, Prometheus servers scrape samples from various targets and use Prometheus remote write API to push data to the distributors. The distributors are responsible for validating the samples they get and can also deduplicate incoming samples from multiple HA replicas of the same Prometheus servers. In order to coordinate which replica is currently elected as the leader, the only replica the distributor will accept samples from, it's needed to have a key value store where the data about the elected replica is saved and it can be console or at CD. Then the valid samples are split into batches and sent to multiple ingestors in parallel. On the right path, the ingester will be responsible for writing incoming series to a long-term store. The incoming series are kept in memory for a while and periodically flushed to the storage. There are different solutions to prevent data loss of in-memory series that have not yet been flushed to the long-term storage by using multiple replicas of each time series in the ingesters and or by using write ahead log, which is used to write to a persistent disk all incoming series samples until they are flushed to the long-term storage. So the ingesters will batch and compress samples in memory and will periodically flush them out to the long-term storage. So when talking about chunk storage, each single time series is stored in a separate object called chunk that contains the samples for a given period, defaults to 12 hours. The chunks are indexed by time range and labels in order to provide a fast lookup across chunks. The index will be kept in a key value store, Amazon DynamoDB, Google Big Table, or Apache Cassandra. And the chunks will be kept in an object store, such as Amazon S3, DynamoDB, Google Cloud Storage, or Microsoft Azure Storage. Note that, for example, if we are talking about AWS, you can store the chunks in S3 and index in DynamoDB or put everything in DynamoDB. Using just S3 is not an option, unless you use the block storage engine that we will discuss in a moment. So we talked about the write path, but again, what about the read path? When we query data, we can do so by sending the query directly to the querier or to the query front end. The query front end is used to accelerate the read path. It can optionally split the query and serve it from the cache. The query front end stores the query into in memory queue, and then the querier component picks it up and executes it. The querier fetch samples from the in memory series samples in the ingesters, and the long term storage while executing query because the ingesters hold the in memory series that have not yet been flushed. Finally, query or sends results back to the query frontend, which then forwards it to the client. The query frontend is an important component that Thanos also added to their architecture lately because of some important features. Splitting, the query frontend split queries of multiple days into multiple single day queries. It gives us the ability to execute queries in parallel on downstream queries, which means A, faster query execution, and B, it prevents out-of-memory issues when executing large multi-day queries, 
It also provides caching. It supports caching query results using memcache, Redis, or an in-memory cache. And queuing, it has a queuing mechanism that is used for different purposes, including retry on failure of large queries in case of OOM errors in the querier. In addition to the cache that the query frontend uses in order to keep the results of a world query, I want just to notice that there are additional caching layers. The chunk cache that stores recent immutable compressed chunks and is used by queries to reduce load on the chunk store, and the index cache, index read cache that stores entire rows from the index and is used by queries to reduce load on the index and the index write cache that is used for deduplication and reducing load on the database by avoiding rewriting index and chunk data that has already been stored. So after going over the chunk storage architecture, let's talk about block storage. The block storage architecture is actually based on Thanos architecture. The block storage itself is based on Prometheus TSDB. It stores each tenant's time series into their own TSDB. The in-memory samples in the ingesters will be flushed when a new TSDB block is created, in default to two hours block range periods, to an object store such as Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, etc. In this architecture, there are two additional components that are based on Thanos components, as we will see soon. First, the store gateway that query blocks from the object store and is used by the querier at query time. It also uses index cache, chunk cache, and metadata cache in order to speed up queries and reduce the number of API calls to object storage. And there is also the compactor, which is responsible for reducing the number of blocks stored in the long-term storage by merging and deduplicating smaller blocks into larger ones, and by that also making them query more efficiently. There are additional components, options, and abilities I didn't talk about. But looking at the Cortex architecture, we can point already point some of the advantages Cortex gives us. It gives us the ability to use chunk storage in case we are putting performance at the top of our priorities, Chunk storage is faster than block storage. We can also decide to use block storage when we are putting simplicity and cost reduction at the top of our priorities. Block storage is eventually cheaper than chunk storage. For example, S3 costs are lower than DynamoDB costs. Plus, it's much more simple to use only S3 bucket than to use and take care of an extra DynamoDB table. Cortex also gives us lots of caching layers, which can improve performance significantly. There is also the query front end, which allows query parallelization and results caching, which also have, which also have great impact on performance. And the push-based model that Cortex is based on also offers multiple benefits. In terms of performance, Prometheus pushed data to Cortex, so if the cluster you are collecting the metrics from and the cluster where the querier is are far away geographically, keeping all the data in Cortex will decrease query latency. There won't be any gaps in the graphs caused by Prometheus restart because the pushes happen as soon as the data is scraped. Even if one of the leaves of Prometheus server is down, you will not see gaps in the data. And again, in terms of availability, when an edge location becomes unavailable, all data up to that point is still available centrally. Also, it's a great option if you don't want to enable ingress to your clusters. And basically, it offers all of the advantages of a push-based system we talked about earlier when we talked about M3. So we can really see how Cortex has been designed with a focus on high performance of long-term storage but there are some disadvantages as well. Some people might find it more complex system than others because it includes relatively large number of components. The Cortex team did add the ability to run Cortex as a single binary, which means a single deployment, which makes things easier. But in production systems, it's recommended to deploy it as multiple independent microservices so you can tune and configure the different components.
Secondly, in order to use all of its features, such as the duplicating, you rely on external dependencies, such as at CD or console. Eventually, those are more moving parts to deploy, operate, and monitor. The push-based model that we mentioned already also have some cons, as we mentioned before. Extra complexity and resources, you need to manage a separate Cortex cluster and storage on top of your Prometheus deployment. If your network has momentary issues and the in-memory buffer of Prometheus cannot hold more data, you might end up losing some of the data. And shipping metrics over the network immediately as they are scraped to a remote storage is not so efficient and might cause data loss if the network is flaky. Lastly, the different storage types have some trade-offs as well. Chunk storage gives us great performance, but is expensive when comparing to the block storage, and it's an additional resource that need to be taken care of. Block storage is cheaper and simpler, but its performance is lower. So we saw that Cortex can offer us multiple ways to deploy it. Each has its own trade-offs. As I mentioned before, the Cortex team worked closely with the Thanos team. So both Cortex and Thanos added components and abilities that eventually improved their solution and added more options and abilities. So let's see what Thanos architecture looks like and how their collaboration with Cortex bettered it. Thanos is also a CNCF incubating project and is a solution for highly available Prometheus with long-term storage. Its initial focus was on operational simplicity and cost effectiveness. But as Cortex added new capabilities that were inspired from Thanos, Thanos also added improvements that were inspired from Cortex. Contrary to Cortex, Thanos originally used a pool-based model architecture. That means that Thanos pulls out Sirius from Prometheus at query time. Later on, inspired by the Cortex push-based model, the Thanos team added support for push-based model as well. Let's take a look at the Thanos pool-based model, starting again with the right path. In Thanos, there is a Thanos sidecar that runs in the same pod as the Prometheus server. Its purpose is to upload data, TSDB blocks, to an object storage, such as AWS S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Microsoft Azure Storage, and to give other Thanos components access to the time series data in Prometheus, as we will see when we will talk about the query path. The sidecar uploads the TSDB blocks to an object storage as Prometheus produces them every two hours. This gives us the ability to configure Prometheus servers to run with relatively low tension. Notice that using this model means Prometheus cannot be fully stateless. If it crashes or restarts, the last two hours of metrics will be lost. So persistent disk for Prometheus is still needed. Using Prometheus Remote Write API gets you closer to stateless Prometheus, but it still won't be fully stateless. So it is still always recommended to have a persistent disk. We can see how the write path here is super easy. You can actually only add the Thanos sidecar to your Prometheus pods and configure your object storage in order to save long-term data. What's great about Thanos is that features can be deployed independently of each other. You can start by only deploying a sidecar and gradually add other components to use and deploy other features. Now let's talk about the query path. Grafana or other API client sends its query to the Thanos query component. Then the query component aggregates and it duplicates data from the underlying components. It query recent metrics from the Thanos sidecar, which exposes Prometheus metrics and older metrics from the store gateway. The store gateway query metrics from the object store and also supports an index cache and experimental caching bucket with chunks and metadata caching using memcached or in-memory cache to speed up loading of chunks from TSDB blocks. There is also the compactor that scans the object storage and is responsible for compacting data and downsampling blocks. 
in order to speed up queries. As for the other projects, there are other components such as ruler that we want to focus on. So as the, the Thanos and Cortex team started to collaborate, it has been decided to add optional multiple components as well. A query front end that can be put in front of Thanos queries to improve the read path in order to have some important features like splitting and results caching. It is based on the Cortex query front end component that we mentioned before. Note that at the moment, only range queries can be split and cached. Those are the only queries that the, query, that the Thanos query front end can process at the moment. The Thanos team also added the option to use a push based model. By adding a component named receiver, which receives data from Prometheus remote write and uploads it to an object storage. So again, we can point to some of the advantages Thanos offer us by looking at its architecture. First, its architecture is relatively simple. We can gradually install its components. Storing long-term data in a block storage gives us, as we mentioned regarding Cortex, simplicity and cost reduction. We talked about the pros and cons of the push-based model before, and the same applies here. We also have the option of using the pool-based model, which is the classic one when talking about Thanos. The pool-based model gives us simplicity and it makes the right path more efficient because it ships full compressed blocks every two hours by default, which can also prevent data loss in case of network issues that last more than a few minutes. And lastly, it, its recently added query frontend can improve performance. Looking at these advantages, we can see how in Thanos case, its main focus is indeed on operational simplicity and cost effectiveness. But again, there are some disadvantages. The block storage is slower than the alternative storage solution that Cortex and M3 offers. The same cons of the push-based model that we talked about also apply here. But there are also trade-offs when we talk about pool-based model. It means that the data from the last two hours is less durable. Samples aren't being saved immediately to a remote storage, which means we cannot access data from the last two hours if there are network issues, and we can even lose it if Prometheus goes down. It might also have worse latency for the query path, if the cluster you are collecting the metrics from, meaning where the Prometheus servers are and the cluster where the query is located are distanced geographically. And there is not as much caching. Query frontend only caches rent queries as we mentioned before. So now after going over the architectures of each solution, Let's see how the four categories I mentioned in the beginning are satisfied or not. Our four categories were performance, high availability, operational complexity, and cost. This is a summary of all that we talked about. And based on this compares comparison, we can see the trade-offs that each solution offers us. There are other aspects that can be compared that we didn't talk about. But the bottom line is that I think all of the solutions are great. I'm pretty positive you will be satisfied with, with whichever solution you choose. But there are some differences that might make one of these tools a better match with your needs and architecture. There are also other aspects according to which we can compare the solutions. For example, from QL compatibility. According to PromLab's latest test, this is the PromQL compatibility of M3, Thanos, and Cortex. Official documentation, as I said, I do find M3 official docs lacking, and they also mentioned in the official docs that additional work is still needed. I personally enjoyed Cortex documentation the best, but Thanos also has great docs. If we're talking about installation via Helm charts, you can find Helm charts for all of these tools, but take note that Cortex does mention that their official Helm chart still needs work, 
that the M3 offers only a Helm chart for the M3DB operator. And the Thanos does not have an official Helm chart, but does have multiple community Helm charts options. If you are using the Q Prometheus stack Helm chart, the Prometheus community chart that many use, including us, by the way, to install Prometheus operator, Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, and more, you already have built-in integration with Thanos. And you can configure the Thanos sidecar very easily with it. So at this point, I'm quite sure you're asking yourself, okay, so what did you choose? We eventually decided to go with Thanos. We wanted to keep it simple. Thanos offers a good enough performance for our use case. Its costs are relatively low. The Q Prometheus stack Helm chart, which we use, has a built-in support to install the Thanos sidecar. So we thought the Thanos answered our needs best. Then again, all of these solutions have pros and cons. The best way for you to choose one is simply to decide on your priorities. And that's it. Thank you for your time and I'm available for questions.